You can see the message is entitled, She's Always a Woman to Me. She can kill with a smile, she can wound with her eyes, and she can ruin your faith with her casual lies, and she only reveals what she wants you to see. She hides like a child, but she's always a woman to me. She can lead you to love, she can take you or leave you. She can ask for the truth, but she'll never believe you. And she'll take what you give her, as long as it's free. She steals like a thief, but she's always a woman to me. Oh, she takes care of herself. She can wait if she wants. She's ahead of her time. Oh, and she never gives out, and she never gives in. She just changes her mind. And she'll promise you more than the Garden of Eden. Then she'll carelessly cut you and laugh while you're bleeding. But she'll bring out the best and the worst you can be. Blame it all on yourself, because she's always a woman to me. The great theologian Billy Joel there. (laughs) That song was released, this will make some of you feel old, 46 years ago. Back then, the quirks and inconsistencies of a woman were portrayed as both maddening and alluring. The lyrics taken if we just read them in isolation like we just did, rather than maybe listening to him sing along with the, the piano and the ballad, might be taken, if you read them, as a complaint. He's not happy, he's not satisfied with who she is. But really what he is doing is expressing what he, try, he, he describes as both uh, attractive and fascinating about this woman that he loves. And when the song was written in 1978 and released and became a very popular song in the culture, marriage rate in the United States was hovering around 60. Uh, That's like 60 marriages a year per 1,000 women in the country. And so we had a pretty good, healthy, not perfect, but it was still a pretty healthy societal trend. Come here to 2024. By comparison, the national marriage rate is now about half of that. 31.5 marriages per 1,000 people in our country. Men, as you look at society and you would hear studies, seem to be in a state of crisis. One study that was released by a nonprofit institute last year called Equimundo, they report this. Many men, especially younger men, are socially disconnected, pessimistic about the future, and turning to online anger. They are facing higher rates of depressive symptoms, suicidal thoughts, and a sense of isolation, as seen in the agreement of 65% that say that no one really knows me well. Maybe you've experienced that if you're sitting here. Maybe that describes you. Maybe some of you look at the room and you see the empty seat next to you and you realize there's somebody in your life who would fit that description. Society has its analysis, and society offers different kinds of solutions to these problems. But it's interesting as we look at today's text that God knew from the beginning that people were not meant to thrive alone. We look around, and you hear reports like this, and hear about depression, you hear about the decline of of people in society. But God looked at the situation from the beginning and saw the potential for such things, and he offered a solution. And Friends, what we're going to learn as we look at the text today, that solution was woman. Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 18, reading again from the English Standard Version. Then the Lord God said, "Is it, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. God had his blessing to the reading of his word. 
And as you pick up in your outline, we're going to see as we learn lessons from this text that first of all, God made woman in his image. God made woman in his image. And this goes back to what we read in chapter 1, verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he, that is God, created him, Adam. But male and female, he created them. And that's important for us to understand here because, again, sometimes it gets generalized or it gets distorted that Christianity puts women in a subservient role. If you're really being tightly defined by what the Bible says, that women are, you know, as it maybe it gets even altered sometimes if we read the King James, women are the helpmeet. And the the real one who needs the assistance and needs the help is the man. He's the primary. He's the driver. He's the thing that everything centers around. When you look at how churches are to be structured, it's the men who are going to be the pastors. It's the men who are the head of the household. It's the men who drive the economy and make things happen. And women are just there kind of along for the ride to help him make it happen. Now, what's the problem with that? What we are trying to establish here is that God creates woman to be making humanity complete. Without woman, there is no humanity. That's important. That's a position of honor. In fact, what I'm going to present to you from the text is that is not only a position of honor, that's a position of equality. Now, what do we mean by that? What do we define by that? Well, we see here, first of all, how did God make woman? How did God make Eve in his image? Well, three different things stood out to me as I studied this text. Number one, first of all, he created woman to be a companion. He created woman to be a companion. The man was alone. Adam was alone. And it was the only thing God saw in all of his creation that wasn't good. If you go through chapter 1, the evening and the morning were the first day, and what happens before that first day? God saw that it was good. And each of the six days of creation, he completes it, he looks at it, he sees it's good, the evening and the morning, second day, third day. But he sees it's good. He sees it's all coming together. It's all fitting together. It's exactly what he envisioned. But he looks at Adam, and he sees it's not right. It's not the way it's meant to be. It's not good. It's not perfect. It's not complete. Why? Because what you see him pointing out to, what he's accomplishing, the purpose that he has here, reveals to us in this activity that God designed people, starting with Adam and Eve, to live in community and not in isolation. You'll notice, too, that it is not Adam saying, God, I need somebody. You're given, you know, the Fido here has Fidey or <laughs> whoever else it is. You know, all these other animals, they have their partners, but where's mine? Sometimes that's how we envision it happening, but that's not what the text says. For all we know, Adam would have been content. Maybe, you know, I'm naming all these animals. I've got all this stuff. Wow, this is pretty cool. But no, God says it's not the purpose I have for you. I don't think it's good, and so I'm going to insert my design into your life and not leave you in isolation. I'm going to give you somebody to care for, somebody to complete you. We could talk about the biological realities as well. Without man and woman, there is no more society. Adam can't procreate on his own. But there is that inherent biological reality, but this is not all of what God sees. Without Eve, Adam would be the only person. Man without woman and woman without man means there is no society. There is no community of people. There's no shared experiences. 
God's intention for human civilization hinged on the creation of man and woman. And so this has to do with procreation, but not exclusively so. What he wants for us is a society that functions in this way. So you read about things like this. This principle is reiterated and emphasized throughout Scripture. For example, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9. Solomon says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. But it is important, as we understand, that another place you could look is Psalm 133, the unity that brothers have and how blessed it is, how, what a pleasant experience it is. We have endorsements in the New Testament in Romans chapter 12 and verse 16 to live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. So there's an instruction of what to do and how to do it. God's love is going to be best seen if we put it on display in love between people, whether it is in a married couple or whether it is in other relationships like we had as we started off the day here today with a members meeting with a group of people who have committed to each other around God's truth and to invest in each other for their spiritual benefit. Because Jesus says, by this, all people will know you are my disciples in John 13, 35. How? If you have love for one another. And in all the different aspects of the relationships that we have, again, starting with marriage, but not limited to that, people will see God's glory in you as you invest in that way, by you the love that you have for each other. So what does that look like in a marriage? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. you ever think about that before we get into marriage, that one of the ways that we demonstrate and put on display that unity as a church is what he just talked about there, how we unite our voices together. There is a certain measure of submission that comes along with that. When Bill says, okay, this side is going to sing with Benefer. I, I kind of resent that, by the way. <laughs> but that, if you, those of you who don't know, that was my wife. <laughs> All right. But anyways, so we go back. He says, we're going to sing over here. And this side over here, you're going to sing with uh, Pastor John and Bonnie. I guess, why not they Johnny? I don't know. <laughs> but what's going on there? You could have rebelled against that. You could have said, well, I'm sitting over here, but I want to sing over there. I'm going to disrupt things. Or maybe, I don't even like that song. They're going to sing, I will call upon the Lord, but I like Amazing Grace, so I'm going to sing that one. But no, we submit. We unite ourselves together. We follow the leading, and we do what the text says. We are singing and making melody in our hearts to God. That's important. And by the way, I don't look around. One of the reasons it's in front so I can focus on Christ and his truth and not look around the congregation. I know that that's the joy that some of you at the backseaters have, and that's great too. We need all kinds. But I would guess that if I were looking around, not all of us take that command seriously. Some of us think of it as optional, or I, I'm not really gifted in that way. I would encourage you to rethink that because this isn't about performance. Nobody's going to gauge you based on whether or not you're on key or on pitch or you get the rhythm right. 
God does tell us it's something that we should do. God does tell us it's something that should be a priority. You even see that in the songs that we chose today. There are some songs that are newer, some songs that are older, maybe more familiar to some of you. We try to repeat those in such a way where we can all come together to unite in that way. And so we repeat those things for a purpose and for a reason to make it easier for us to collectively share in that experience. Okay, back on to marriage. Wives, verse 22 of Ephesians 5. Submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so should also wives submit in everything to their husbands. Important for us to consider. We'll talk about this actually in more detail next week when we focus more specifically on marriage. But notice it doesn't say women submit yourselves to men. It says wives submit yourselves to husbands. That's important. It's in, also in the structure of the passage. What does it say in the verses preceding there? In verse 20, I think it is. Submit yourselves to one another in the fear of God. That's important too. It helps us understand that yes, the Bible has priorities and has structures and has hierarchies, but there is not an inherent superiority of male to female that is, runs true in everything, there is a place for women to have different positions, different areas of responsibility without taking over functions that are clearly defined in Scripture. So we can have, even though she wasn't playing the piano up here, we can have Joy serving as a woman in this role of organizing all these guys and trying to keep all these pieces together. And she does a tremendous job of it. It's something we're very thankful for. And it's not limited to, that, to her because she's not a man, so she can do all the stuff, but really Bill's in charge. We put her in that position of responsibility because she has the gifts and she has the capabilities, and we want to see her develop and thrive. There are women functioning now, even as this service is going on, in different areas of care and oversight for children. You say, well, that's typical, Pastor. You know, that's the place for women in a Baptist church, right? It's music and children's ministry. We're grateful for women who serve in women and children's ministry. That's not the only place that you can do. That's not the only way you can serve. And we are working diligently to make sure that your gifting Your calling, your abilities, your capabilities are there for others to hear and benefit from. That's part of what we endeavor to do as a church. It's part of what we endeavor to celebrate here in our congregation. Even as we would also understand, there are specific roles and limitations for one another. Men can't have babies. That's part of the reality too, because God has a biological reality. God does create categories that can't be crossed over. And you need to understand, by the way, that when we talk about these things and how our society is sifting through those things, that's part of where all of the the talk of society has ended up. That there's nothing that these categories that can't be transcended. And even if we have to go into physical alteration and things, it's all about individuality. And it's a lack. It's a lack of submission to God and how He has established these things. And that's the heart, really, isn't it, of sin, as we see it laid out here. Sin is a rebellion against God's design, against God's directives. Sin can also be forgiven. Sin can also be repented of and turned and changed to come in line with what God intends for us. More on that as we continue. I'm not going to stop with the submissive because I would get rebuked at home. <laughs> so we'll keep reading as we see in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives 
as with Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Again, we're going to talk more about the marriage relationship next week. But here is the point I want to make for you right now. Is that when a marriage is functioning well, when it's working like it's supposed to, what do we realize? God's glory is going to be seen. Just like His glory is going to be seen in His relationship with Christ in the church, on the macro level, at the micro level, one of the best things that you can do to present Christ to your family who doesn't know the Lord, to your neighbors, is to have a healthy, functioning marriage where you express love and care and concern for each other, where you submit to each other the way that God intends. And it does say, yes, that wives submit to the husbands and husbands care for their wives. But men, that doesn't mean there's not places where in caring for your wives you don't learn how to give and take. That you don't learn how to submit to one another. Ladies, that also doesn't mean that you don't also realize that in order for there to be a good harmony and structure, somebody has to be able to have the final say. But there's wisdom in how that looks. And if you're going to work together in harmony, you understand that you have to be good companions to each other. Why do we talk about companions? Because that's the language God uses, but it's also the language that God uses about himself, that he is a companion, a helper to us. And that's what we see the next point on your outline. We are not putting ourselves in here, as we've already stated, that men are superior, women are inferior. We are going to suggest so that they do fill different roles. But it's important for us to realize that when God creates woman, when God creates the one that Adam would call Eve, he does so creating her in his image as a helper because that's the term that he uses to describe himself. For example, in Psalm 33, verse 20, The psalmist speaks of God in this way under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Our soul waits for the Lord. And what is the Lord? What is God? What is Yahweh? Yahweh, God, is our help and our shield. He is, that's the same word help that it uses to describe woman in Genesis 2. Woman is the helper. God is a helper. These themes are common throughout the Psalms. For example, again in Psalm 70, verse 5, David cries out, I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Isaiah records in Isaiah 41, verse 10 and 13. In verse 13, he says, I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I to say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. And so again, If God uses this language to describe himself and he creates woman to fulfill that function, this is not demeaning. This is putting her in a very crucial position for the human race. One way that we're told to help each other in Scripture is exemplified in Proverbs 31. Not in the passage yet that describes the virtuous woman, but earlier in the verse, in the chapter, it says in verse 9, open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. 
But then, when you get into the virtuous woman passage in Psalm 31, how does she carry out her virtue? What does she do to put it on display? In verse 20, she opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. One of the ways that she demonstrates her value, her virtue, is by being godly and helping the poor. God is our helper. And if we are to emulate God, all of us need to be helpers. But particularly understanding. That's the reason why God created this contrast in the sexes. To help each other out. God made woman to accomplish that. He created her in His image to be a companion, to be a helper, and to ensure goodness. To ensure goodness. That's the third point there in your outline. Without woman, as we've already mentioned, creation was not good. It is not good, God says, that man should be alone. It's important to say that God has prepared, as one commentator, Alan Rossett, said, in this point of Scripture in Genesis chapter 2, God has prepared human beings, male and female, with the spiritual capacity and communal assistance to serve Him and to keep His commands so that they might live and enjoy the bounty of His creation. So they have the capability to serve God, but they can also not serve God well alone. That's what that big phrase communal assistance means. That means in order to accomplish all of God's purposes, each one must somehow rely on the other to get it done. If we are going to be a good local church, by the way, that means you can't just rely on one or two people. You know, it's not just the guy up here on the platform who wears the coat because he's the important guy. No, all of us have to come together to fulfill all of the capabilities, all of the things that God has for Calvary Baptist Church. There has to be a leader, but there has to be also people connecting and uniting together. People to give, people to serve, people to reach out in their places of work, in their neighborhoods. We spread our influence across the city, across the state, and even across the world because we are obedient to what Jesus Christ has commissioned us to do, to go and preach the gospel to every creature. These models, these expectations have their root in Genesis chapter 2, that God has good purposes for us to follow. Listen to what he says to the nation of Israel as they're preparing to enter into the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'll begin reading in verse 11. God says to them, For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend for, to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over to the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways and by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then, then, after you hear all these things, and he says, this is easy for you, this is accomplishable, this is something you have the capability of doing, following God's commandments. If you follow God's commandments, then, he says, the Lord your God will bless you. Then you shall live and multiply. You will be blessed in the land you are entering to take possession of it. So part of the blessing Productivity is reproduction. See how that, that results in good, healthy marriages, good, healthy families. You'll live and multiply. Verse 17, But if your heart turns away, and you will not hear, 
but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them. I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, holding fast to Him, for He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. We know, as we study the Old Testament and look at history, there were times where Israel got it right. There were times where Israel obeyed. But their history is replete with times where they didn't. They were struck with famine. They were struck with all kinds of consequences of lack of productivity. Things not happening because God withheld His blessings because they were not obedient. Sin always has consequences. Where does that put us today? Heard what he said earlier? This is not far away from you. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. Paul draws on that language in Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. And then Paul makes application to the reality of the gospel. And he says, that is the word of faith that we proclaim because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. The reality is, friends, if we're looking at what God intended for a woman, what God intended for a human society, to be a companion, to be a helper, to make sure everything was good. We don't get that all right. And it's because of the reality of sin. We have broken marriages. We have, even we talk about the churches, churches don't always get along. You could look at the history of Calvary and see there have been times where churches didn't get along. And there you look around the room. There are people who used to sit next to you in some of these chairs who aren't here because we couldn't all get along. We lament that. It makes our heart ache. But what is the solution? Paul says, the word is in your mouth and in your heart. Your hope is to call on Jesus. He will give you salvation. He can help you with the sin problems you're dealing with now. We're not just talking now, although the major application is, friend, if you don't know Jesus, please know this. The consequences of your sin, just like they are going to be for Adam and Eve in the garden, means separation from God. But He calls us to repent. He calls us back to Himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Me. When you believe in Jesus, He loved the world so much that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The answer to your struggle is Jesus Christ. The answer for you, Christian, to make sure that people see that Gospel and see its consistency, see its benefits in your life, is for you to live harmoniously. To live in harmony with each other. So again, one of the best things that you can do for your Christian testimony is to have a healthy marriage. It's to be unified. This is what God had for Adam and Eve. To be unified. God has supplied us with the blessings of community. Godly marriages, church harmony, being good citizens, What he wanted for Adam and Eve was to have it be very good. 
the kind of sin and destructiveness that we're talking about, is the root cause of shattered marriages, strife and discord among believers, and fragmentation and turmoil in our society where we can't get along because we don't see eye to eye. But God gives us the answers to reclaiming His blessings. It starts with the acknowledgement of our sin. You understand that a lot of times what we do when we see the problems in society, what I've done so many times with trying to deal with people who are having conflict and division in their marriage. I get a spouse coming into the office and say, this is all the other person's problems. And pastor, you need to help me change them. And a lot of times, they're not always wrong either. There are problems that that person needs to change. If that person isn't in the room, where do we have to start? We have to start with you. What can you do to change? Well, it's also good to have them both in the, in the room at the same time so they can be accountable to each other and hear what needs to change. But I would say, even in the worst case situations that I've had to deal with over the course of my pastoral ministry, I've never had a situation in a marriage where there were problems where it was only one person who needed to change. There's always, even in the very worst case scenarios, places where we need to submit ourselves to God and to His Repair his solution for the brokenness that we experience. Even if that is nothing else than the other's resentment and bitterness over the person's transgressions. There needs to be that acknowledgement both of the wrongdoing and then the acceptance of what Christ offers. Just like it is in salvation with the solution that God provides through the sacrifice of Jesus. As a believer, we are taught by God's Word. We are enabled by God's Spirit and dwelt by Him to live a different kind of a way than the world around us does. And it isn't that Christians have it perfect and we get saved. That means you get a perfect marriage. That means all the Christians everywhere get along. You just have to look at how many Baptist churches there are in Rochester to understand it doesn't work that way. There's a lot of Christians who find it difficult. And you go to some of those churches and you see people who you used to go to church with. Because it's not just past history, it's present reality as well. Because we have conflict. We have division. And again, that ought to break our heart. It is not something that is anything to be proud of. We know, brothers and sisters, when we face the inevitability of sin, of selfishness, we can overcome it through Jesus Christ. So I would even encourage you, even as we had the members meeting this morning, if you weren't there again, we are cleaning the role, I think, of 74 different people who haven't been around. Some of them have relocated. Some of them uh, we've clarified have gone on to other churches. Some of them we've just lost contact with. But that's difficult. That's hard. It's not something we celebrate and rejoice in. But it is something that we ought to be mindful of. We don't harbor bitterness, resentment, or grudges against people who ought to be here but aren't. So we think. God can still work in them if they're at another church. If they're at Cornerstone, if they're at the E-Free Church, if they're at Autumn Ridge, that doesn't mean they've turned their back on Scripture. That doesn't mean they've disallowed themselves from the gospel of Jesus Christ. It means for whatever reason, God's put them in a different situation. Maybe it's the hardness of their heart. Maybe it's something else that we just didn't realize was going on. Friend, you can still be a friend to them. You can still rejoice in that, the fact that God has not abandoned them 
And you don't need to be awkward and avoid them because you know it's it's like you're divorced or something like that. You still got to find a way to move on for the glory of God and for the benefit of your own conscience. Work to love such people, even though you might not have the same relationship you used to have when you were here, and that's okay too, because we are a church. We do function in that unity together that we can't in the same way with other congregations. There are ways that we can encourage one another. We are not on different teams. We're all under the same Savior, the same Commander-in-Chief. We should realize that. We should celebrate that, even as we also work to glorify God in the particular context that He's given to us. So, the answers that Jesus provides mean that selfish husbands can learn to be kind and caring. Combative wives can learn to be sweet and submissive. And cantankerous, combative church members can learn to love each other too. Something we need to remember. We can live differently. This isn't just some ideal, some dream that's out there that the Bible talks about but nobody ever actually lives. Friends, this is something we can and should realize to be unified and to live to serve. Because God is our helper. Just like Israel looked to Him for their assistance and aid, and just as we are supposed to be like Christ, the way that we can be like Christ is to be His representatives, to be out there helping others. It is important in your marriage. It is important in your family. It's important in your church. It's important in your relationship with the outside world. Find ways to be generous. Find ways to invest in one another. So what if the person is a different political party than you or has a different skin color than you or speaks a different language than you or lives even in a different kind of a relationship than one that you see as an endorsed in Scripture. That doesn't mean that we have the right to be hostile or combative. It means they just need a different kind of love. It means that they need the patience to see what God is doing and can do through you and me. Put it on display so that they can see, so they can have the same benefits. You're not going to argue anybody into heaven. but Maybe by serving, you can love them to help them see their need of something that's different in your life. And that difference is Jesus Christ. The point I want you to remember as we conclude the message this morning is, friends, just like God created Eve to be Adam's companion, to be His helper. We too, as Christians, ought to realize that God created us in a situation where we need to be good neighbors. We need to get along with each other. We need to learn to be good company. And that is the important part. Whether it is in your marriage, get along with your spouse. Get along with your kids. Your fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. In the nurture and admonition of the Lord, do not provoke them to anger, Paul says in another passage, lest they be discouraged. That means you have to tell them how to do it, but it also tells you have to have some patience as they implement it. They're not going to get it perfect the first time, and you've got to work with them through it. You've got to learn to be good neighbors. You've got to learn to be patient so that they can hear and see what God has done in your life do for them. Why? Not because those people are always worthy, your spouse, your children, your neighbors, but it's because we believe that Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of it all. And so we love them not for their own sake, but for the sake of the one who gave his life for us. Father, we do thank you that you didn't love us because we deserved it, because we wouldn't have anything that we have today if that were true but that while we were yet sinners, 
You sent your Son to die for us. This is how you demonstrated that love. And this is the kind of sacrificial love that you want us to demonstrate for others. We thank you, Lord, that even as we've seen in this text, you've always intended for people to be companions, for people to live with the realities of each other in society, in the homes, in the families, and in marriages. So Lord, give us patience to see these things through, to correct the errors where they are in our lives, to repent of our pride, to repent of our selfishness, to repent even of our immorality, but things there that are destructive and against your expectations. And help us through your word and through your spirit to embrace your truth, to be the men and women you want us to be, to be the kind of family, the kind of home, the kind of marriage, the kind of church, the kind of society that you would have us be. Because we want you more than anything else, to be honored and glorified because you, through your Son Jesus, are worthy, worthy of it all. In his name we pray.